Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Earthlight by Arthur C. Clarke. This is a pan science fiction uh, novel by the master of sci fi. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through it and check out my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads. Two centuries from now, there may be men who do not owe allegiance to any nation on Earth, or even to Earth itself. This brilliant story tells of a time when man stands upon the moon and the planets, of men now divided by the vast stretches of the solar system, but once again torn by jealousy and fear. With vaulting imagination, Arthur C. Clarke describes life on the strange, awe-inspiring surface of the moon, scene of a most fantastic and exciting contest of arms. And yeah, it's kind of like a science fictional... Um, espionage thriller I suppose we would call it um, and I've tabbed a lot of the stuff I've tabbed out to be honest is to do with the science which I thought was fascinating so Sadler is uh, heading off to the moon for the first time um, and he's chatting to a guy called Moulton you were lucky said Moulton I've ridden this run a hundred times but I've never seen that better come back into the car they'll be serving a snack in a minute nothing more to see now anyway that thought Sadler was hardly true the blazing earthlight, coming back into its own now that the sun was gone, flooded the great plain that the ancient astronomers had so inaccurately christened the Sea of Rains. Compared with the mountains that lay behind, it was not spectacular, yet it was still something to catch the breath. I'll wait a while, Sadler answered. Remember, this is all new to me and I don't want to miss any of it. Moulton laughed, not unkindly. Can't say I blame you, he said. Afraid we sometimes take things for granted. And obviously we get a little reference to Earthlight there, the, um, the title. And as a vegan, I thought this was quite interesting to read. The meal was tasty but unidentifiable. Like all food on the moon, it would have been grown in the great hydroponic farms that sprawled their square kilometres of pressurised greenhouses along the equator. The meat, of course, was presumably synthetic. It might have been beef, but Sadler happened to know that the only cow on the moon lived in luxury at the Hipparchus Zoo. This was the sort of useless information his diabolically retentive mind was always picking up and refusing to disgorge. And he's looking at a big old organisation chart uh, that he's got and uh, he, he thinks Ancient man, he remembered, had once been defined as a tool-making animal. He often felt that the best description of modern man would be a paper-wasting animal. Interesting to read that on something written on paper, you know. And here I want to read this, this long paragraph, but that's because this explains what's at the heart of this book. Basically the struggle for resources that's hampering mankind's further expansion throughout the universe. As a result of these internal tides, the crust of the earth is rich in heavy metals, far richer than that of any other of the planets. They hoard their wealth far down within their unreachable cores, protected by pressures and temperatures that guard them from man's depredations. So, as human civilization spread outwards from earth, the drain on the mother world's dwindling resources steadily increased. The light elements existed on the other planets in unlimited amounts, but such essential metals as mercury, lead, uranium, platinum, thorium and tungsten were almost unobtainable. For many of them, no substitutes existed. Their large-scale synthesis was impractical, despite two centuries of effort, and modern technology could not survive without them. It was an unfortunate situation, and a very galling one for the independent republics on Mars, Venus, and the larger satellites, which had now united to form the Federation. It kept them dependent upon Earth, and prevented their expansion towards the frontiers of the solar system. Though they had searched among the asteroids and moons, among the rubble left over when the worlds were formed, they had found little but worthless rock and ice. They must go cap in hand to the mother planet for almost every gram of a dozen metals that were more precious than gold. That in itself might not have been serious, had not Earth grown steadily more jealous of its offspring during the 200 years since the dawn of space travel. It was an old story, perhaps its classic example being the case of England and the American colonies. It has been truly said that history never repeats itself, but historical situations recur. The men who governed Earth were far more intelligent than George III. Nevertheless, they were beginning to show the same reactions as that unfortunate monarch. And that really sets up the kind of core thing at the heart of this, the um, Federation versus Earth. And um, what's his name? Our, our main character, whose name I've already forgotten. Um, he was not mentioned by name on the, in the blurb, but our main character's kind of sent to find out who's who's leaking information from the moon and uh, he's had to, to lie to his wife about where he's gone um, and we get Alicia would expect him to call her and that was the one thing he dared not do as far as his wife and his friends were concerned he was still on earth there was no way of calling from the moon without revealing his location for the two and a half second time lag would betray him at once oh and Jameson is wiping photographic developing fluid from his hands after more than 300 years certain aspects of photography were quite unchanged um, obviously that has not aged particularly well. I mean this was first published in uh, 1955 so you can forgive him for not predicting the digital camera I suppose. And uh, Sadler, he's, he asks Vagnall, uh, Vagnall uh, the secretary, uh, why is this star so important because there is a star that's gone supernova? 
Well, he began, I guess stars are like people. The well-behaved ones never attract much attention. They teach us something, of course, but we can learn a lot more from the ones that go off the rails. And do stars do that sort of thing fairly often? Every year about 100 blow up in our galaxy alone, but these are only ordinary novae. At their peak they may be about 100,000 times as bright as the sun. A supernova is a very much rarer and very much more exciting affair. We still don't know what causes it, but when a star goes super it may become several billion times brighter than the sun. In fact it can outshine all the other stars in the galaxy added together. So they head off to see um, like the communications room. Uh, they were all presided over by the duty signals officer who discouraged casual visitors with a large notice reading positively and absolutely no admittance to unauthorized persons. That doesn't mean us, said Wheeler, opening the door. He was promptly contradicted by a still larger notice. This means you. Unabashed, he turned to the grinning saddler and added, all the places you're really not supposed to enter are kept locked anyway. And just this little paragraph I think is very beautiful and very telling. There were still those who believed that man would have been happier had he stayed on his own planet, but it was rather too late now to do anything about that. In any case, had he remained on Earth, he would not have been man. The restlessness that had driven him over the face of his own world, that had made him climb the skies and plumb the seas, would not be assuaged while the moon and planets beckoned him across the deeps of space. Yeah, something very human. So like that, uh, was it Edmund Hillary was asked why, somebody was asked I think why they climbed Everest? Um, and the answer was because it was there and this little paragraph is very telling because even today you know we're looking at doing manned missions to Mars um, and we have to go via the moon it's impractical to launch from Earth it's much more practical to launch from the moon and Clark kind of wrote about that he says Central City and the other bases that have been established with such labour were islands of life in an immense wilderness, oases in a silent desert of blazing light or inky darkness. There had been many who had asked whether the effort needed to survive here was worthwhile, since the colonisation of Mars and Venus offered much greater opportunities. But for all the problems it presented him, man could not do without the moon. It had been his first bridgehead in space and was still the key to the planets. The liners that plied from world to world obtained all their propellant mass here, filling their great tanks with a finely divided dust which the ionic rockets would spit out in electrified jets. By obtaining that dust from the moon and not having to lift it through the enormous gravity field of Earth, it had been possible to reduce the cost of space travel more than tenfold. Indeed, without the moon as a refueling base, economical spaceflight could never have been achieved. Very prescient considering, again, what we're looking at today. So he ends up going to uh, the equivalent of the moon's capital city uh, and there are various little kind of innovations there. Um, to try and make it easier for people who aren't used to being on the moon, you know? And this is one of them, and it doesn't really work that well. <laughs> Many of the visitors from Earth were to be found here. Sadler, a selenite of eight days standing, found himself eyeing the obvious newcomers with amused contempt. Many of them had hired weight belts as soon as they entered the city, under the impression that this was the safest thing to do. Sadler had been warned about this fallacy in time, and so had avoided contributing to what was really a mild racket. It was true that if you loaded yourself down with lead, there was less danger of soaring off the ground with incautious steps, and perhaps terminating the trajectory upon your head. But surprisingly few people realised the distinction between weight and inertia, which made these belts of such dubious value. When one tried to start moving, or to stop in a hurry, one quickly found that though 100 kilos of lead might weigh only 16 kilos here, it had exactly the same momentum as it did on Earth. And then there's an artificial thunderstorm um, and this was kind of interesting. Um, Sadler could never see lightning without counting the seconds before the thunder peal. It came when he had got to six making it two kilometers away. That of course would put it well outside the dome in the soundless vacuum of space. Oh well one had to allow some artistic license and it wasn't fair to quibble over points like this. But it's very cool like they literally have artificial rain up there and it's actually needed as well because it, it kind of gets rid of the uh, lunar dust that people bring in. And again, another little sciencey bit I enjoyed. The travellers paused here to open a few food packs and make some coffee in the pressure kettle. One of the minor discomforts of life on the moon is that really hot drinks are an impossibility. Water boils at about 70 degrees centigrade in the oxygen-rich, low-pressure atmosphere universally employed. After a while, however, one grows used to lukewarm beverages. I'd be alright, I'd just have energy drinks. You get this little line, very small men usually took care to compensate for their physical deficiencies. How many dictators had been of even average height? And from all accounts, McLaurin was one of the toughest characters on the moon. But I'm sure that's a fallacy. I'm sure I've read a piece of research into that that found that that's not true, the Napoleon complex or whatever isn't a, actually a thing. And so Sadler, again, he's this reluctant spy and he's re re reflecting on the fact that because there's not been any serious warfare for years, the art of spying is lost. There's only really like gifted amateurs. Um, and he says, he had never realized the isolation in which a spy must work, the horrible feeling that you are alone, that there is no one you can trust, no one with whom you can share your burdens. 
And that's sad, I've never thought of, not, never thought of it like that before. So here we learn um, a bit of an, like the attitudes towards overpopulation and things like that. Um, Had he after all made a mistake? Sometimes he bitterly regretted the conventional caution which had ruled the first year of their married life. Like most couples on the overpopulated planet that swam before his eyes, they had waited to prove their compatibility before embarking on the adventure of parenthood. In this age, it was a definite social stigma to have children before one had been married for several years. It was a proof of fecklessness and irresponsibility. And uh, we get the idea that uh, loyalty isn't just a matter of birth, but ideals. There can be times when morality and patriotism clash, uh, which I think is very important because people kind of say, if you criticize your country, you're not patriotic. Personally, I'm not patriotic anyway, but you can be patriotic and still criticize your country. If anything, it is the patriotic thing to do to try and find ways to make your country a better place, you know? We get the idea, uh, there are plenty of pacifists before the outbreak of war, but few after it actually starts. I would consider myself a pacifist. And so we get this great battle between Earth and the Federation and um, we get this short passage here. Even today, little has ever been revealed concerning the weapons used in the Battle of Pico. It is known that missiles played only a minor part in the engagement. In space warfare, anything short of a direct hit is almost useless since there is nothing to transmit the energy of a shockwave. An atom bomb exploding a few hundred meters away can cause no blast damage, and even its radiation can do little harm to well-protected structures. Moreover, both Earth and the Federation had effective means of diverting ordinary projectiles. Purely non-material weapons played the most effective roles. The simplest of these were the ion beams developed directly from the drive units of spaceships. Since the invention of the first radio tubes, almost three centuries before, men had been learning how to produce and focus ever more concentrated streams of charged particles. The climax had been reached in spaceship propulsion with the so-called ion rocket, generating its thrust from the emission of intense beams of electrically charged particles. The deadliness of these beams had caused many accidents in space, even though they were deliberately defocused to limit their effective range. There was, of course, an obvious answer to such weapons. The electric and magnetic fields which produced them could also be used for their dispersion, converting them from annihilating beams into a harmless scattered spray. More effective, but more difficult to build, were the weapons using pure radiation. Yet even here, both Earth and Federation had succeeded. It remained to be seen which had done the better job, the superior science of the Federation, or the greater productive capacity of Earth. And uh, Command Commodore Brennan, who is leading the, um, the separatist troops, um, right before the battle, he was not concerned with the place he would take in history when men look back upon this day. He only wondered, has had all who would ever face battle for the first time, where he would be this same time tomorrow. And uh, a May Day transmission gets sent out and um, we get this little passage which was fascinating. Um, there was so little that the commander of a spaceship could do. There, in the whole history of astronautics there have been only three cases of a successful rescue operation in space. There are two main reasons for this, only one of which is widely advertised by the shipping lines. Any serious disaster in space is extremely rare. Almost all accidents occur during planet fall or departure. Once a ship has reached space and has swung into the orbit that will lead it effortlessly to its destination, it is safe from all hazards except internal, mechanical troubles. Such troubles occur more often than the passengers ever know, but are usually trivial and are quietly dealt with by the crew. All spaceships, by law, are built in several independent sections, any one of which can serve as a refuge in an emergency. So the worst that ever happens is that some uncomfortable hours are spent by all while an irate captain breathes heavily down the neck of his engineering officer. The second reason why space rescues are so rare is that they are almost impossible from the nature of things. Spaceships travel at enormous velocities on exactly calculated paths which do not permit of major alterations as the passengers of the Pegasus were now beginning to appreciate. The orbit any ship follows from one planet to another is unique. No other vessel will ever follow the same path again among the changing patterns of the planets. There are no shipping lanes in space, and it's rare indeed for one ship to pass within a million kilometers of another. Even when this does happen, the difference of speed is almost always so great that contact is impossible. Um, I just thought that was fascinating, and it kind of illustrates some of the issues with you know, that we see in The Martian by Andy Weir. We got a reference to people who have uh, sneaked, snuck off to have a surreptitious smoke in the toilet, who have noticed that the air was rich as their cigarette only lasted a few seconds because there was so much oxygen in it. And I just always find it interesting in old sci-fi to see references to people smoking on board a spaceship. Wouldn't happen now, would it? And afterwards, um, we get this which I thought was quite touching, kind of about the equality of the two sides, you know. It's basically a 1-1 a draw, you know. 
Uh, every evening as the sun drops down behind the lonely pyramid of Pico, the shadow of the great mountain reaches out to engulf the metal column that will stand in the sea of rains as long as the sea itself endures. There are 527 names on that column in alphabetical order. No mark distinguishes the men who died for the Federation from those who died for Earth, and perhaps this simple fact is the best proof that they did not die in vain. Oh, and we get a kid on the moon, um and he speaks this kind of vernacular and we get it was really astonishing that despite the interplanetary radio networks distinct differences of speech were springing up on the boy could doubtless speak perfectly good earth english when he wanted to but it was not his language of everyday communication and finally um we discover who the uh who the leak was on the moon who was the mole um and he says um what is trees a million matter of dates quoting a french statesman named talleyrand but i thought that was a good quote all right so all in all Earthlight by arthur c Clarke. i mean i thought it was interesting to see kind of this interstellar espionage and war going on uh, really well thought out i love the science in it the characterization was pretty good but for me it was really the plotting that stood out the most i would recommend it to arthur c Clarke fans or anyone who isn't a fan of sci-fi in general uh, i gave Earthlight by arthur c Clarke probably probably a four out of five so there we have it, that's what I made of Earthlight by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.